know you're familiar with the Cargors. I taught you everything you know about them. But let me tell you... I that knew that they were cats. Did we go in and we wait? Ambush. How military. And it works. I like it. <sighs> that is why the military use it. Also, is not most hunting in ambush. Or do you typically run up to your prey screaming? It's an axe. As hunters do in the movies. I've been blogging about uh, this year's NaNoWriMo. My work on the project. So I have now gone public with the title of Orcs vs. Wolves. Something I want to try and do with this version of Werewolves is address uh, werewolf mentality. Like how packs work and how individual wolves think. And uh, the contrasts between the human and wolf logic and what it would be like for someone who is sort of a part of both worlds. But very few of the werewolf movies that I've seen really get into the wolf aspect so much. They basically just treat the werewolf as a monster. And the stories are just all about turning into a monster. That is one thing where, annoyingly, I have to give the Twilight films credit because they actually do address wolf mentality. I'm not saying they do it well. I don't actually know enough about the subject to be able to say. But at least they do it. At least they acknowledge that werewolves are wolves. Like, there is a wolf aspect to being a werewolf. It's not just about being a great big furry thing. You might as well just be a bear at that point. Which you can also do. There is such a thing as were-bears. In fantasy. And I don't quite know why. That was something that I remembered from the first time... Uh, and I'd say the only time. That I went through the Twilight Anthology. was I remembered that they had a different kind of a take on werewolves, and it was something that I appreciated. But I only specifically remembered that being the case in New Moon. Maybe just because that was the one that left the impression on me. So I did end up checking out New Moon a second time. As I was prepping for this year's Nano. In contrast to when I did Vampires vs. Dragons last year, and I very adamantly decided not to turn to the Twilight films for inspiration on vampires. Even though Twilight does have some uh, insightful things to say about the issues of being a vampire, it is difficult to shake off the reputation of the sunlight's glitter and how much of a contrast that is to every other version of vampires to a point of being beyond reason. If you think about the top universal rules as far as vampires work, being killed by sunlight is the number two thing that comes to my mind. Number one thing being sucking blood. I'm not saying that you can't go against established rules for things like vampires. Because that in itself has become a fairly common thing for vampire stories is to address things that have been regarded as rules and repurpose them as misconceptions. 
to the point that that itself has become cliche. But if you are going to go against established rules, you do need to have a good reason. And my thing about the sunlight glitter is that there was no reason for it. It's breaking off one of the main things that makes a vampire a vampire. For purposes of something that has no relevance to the plot. Because I thought that the whole point of having the story set where it was was the fact that it was always cloudy. And so therefore was actually safe. For vampires. Not safe from being shiny. It does technically have some plot relevance in New Moon, but only in the very convoluted way that could have been done so many other better ways. So yeah, reputation wise, there's a lot in the Twilight stories to make fun of. There is a lot of love stories and not love stories that are still better love stories than Twilight. But I do give credit where it's due. It does address some things about vampire life or vampire existence, if you'd rather that are things that don't often get addressed. And that is the kind of stuff that writers like me do find interesting and appreciate. Even if I feel like a lot of the rest of the story was not done very well. Oh yeah, something I've been meaning to check out. If I could get a good view of the moon. Yeah, that looks... I, I don't have the moon memorized exactly, but that looks like ours. I think Tolkien's approach to Middle-earth as a fantasy world was very... Uh, in the classical fantasy tale style, in that... Um, the old school fantasy tales are always a long time ago in a land far, far away. Which was easy to do back in the day because not that many lands were charted. As opposed to today where we pretty much know every square foot of Earth. But back in the day when fairy tales were first being invented, it was easy to buy into the idea that Wherever you lived was just one land out of many, some of which were very far away. And whereas uh, fantasy tales being invented these days uh, tend to be told with an approach that's more like it's a another dimension, or another realm, or another plane of existence. Like, the explanations for how these worlds might exist tend to be themselves a bit sci-fi in nature. One of the ways of telling a story in the uh, classical fairy tale style is to have the same moon. Because one surefire way of verifying that you're in the same world is to have the same sky. But if you want to be vague about whether you're taking the classical fantasy approach and the newer style fantasy approach, is when you're doing the moon, you can just make it a kind of vague, just like a general bright light. You don't necessarily need to be able to see the face of it. 
and in that way you can leave it ambiguous as to which approach you're taking. I don't know if it bothers other people as much as it bothers me, but... Like when I was playing Skyrim, I get very immersed in that world. It's a very good, realistic fantasy world that I totally feel like I'm a part of while I'm playing it. But there is this thing that happens in that game of whenever I look up at the sky and I see two moons. And what happens when I look up at the sky and I see two moons is I get pulled out of the fantasy genre and pulled into science fiction. Because multiple moons is not an Earth thing. It is potentially an alternate fantasy world thing. And that's okay. But what it does when I see two moons is I think about planets and how planets work. And planets is a science fiction thing, not a classical fairy tale thing. So, like, the inhabitants of Skyrim, instead of being people from a land far, far away, they are now aliens. Because they live on a completely different planet. It's not how traditional fantasy should feel. So when people are writing fantasy, like a pure fantasy, and uh, not something that's a sci-fi fantasy crossbreed like Star Wars or Guardians of the Galaxy. I generally recommend them either using either using the same sky as Earth has, or an ambiguous one, but not one that is very clearly different. Just because it gets audiences into the wrong headspace for pure fantasy. When Tolkien was first putting together Middle-earth, if I understand his history correctly, he was trying to put together something that would serve as a sort of Greco-Roman style mythology for England. Because he was upset that England didn't have a similar mythology. Even though there is King Arthur and Merlin and all that, I see wanted something that had a particular feel to it. So since Tolkien's objective was creating a mythos for England, it's safe to say that his approach to fantasy was the classical style of making it a long time ago in a land far, far away. With the adjustment of... it actually wasn't that far away, it was England. But it was much longer ago. I wanted to create a land that could believably turn into and become England over numerous millennia. Now, the classical fantasy style, uh, I think, it became a more difficult to do as mankind became more aware of the different parts of the globe. But there are different strategies that can be applied in modern times for doing the classical style of writing your fantasy world as if it is a part of our world. So one of the 
strategies that I've seen for uh, doing classical style fantasy worlds in the modern era is um, what Tolkien did, which is to present it as being uh, much further back in time to beyond the recording of human history. Or at least before the recording of modern human history. And the making it a just a longer time ago approach does work out as long as you don't do anything with your world that can't believably uh, work as a part of actual Earth history, such as uh, multiple moons and uh, different laws of physics and stuff like that. I talked about uh, one way of doing classical fantasy in uh, the modern era, but there was at least one other that comes to mind, and that is the approach done by C.S. Lewis with Chronicles of Narnia, which was instead of saying that this place is a land far, far away. Uh, he basically just made it another realm that exists parallel to this one, which makes it sound a bit more science fiction-y because it's like getting into alternate dimensions and the stuff, and Narnia even addresses uh, the idea of different um, speeds at which time passes, depending on which realm you're in, which sounds science fiction-y. But his explanations for it are more magical, so they're more in keeping with the fantasy genre. And I do like that balance. I like when you can have elements that are magical in nature, but still address from a scientific perspective how that magic affects things. The impact that it has on things like the flow of time and how it works traveling between realms. And the mystery of the magical element is not lost in Chronicles of Narnia, because there is still this thing where when the kids come back to Earth, they go back from being the adults that they were in Narnia to being the children that they are on Earth again. And that doesn't seem very sciencey to me. That seems like something that's more magical in nature. But with the alternate realm approach, you don't have to have your world make sense as being something that is physically a part of the real world or the everyday world. The characters that I tend to like most are the ones that I consider interesting. More specifically, the characters who have interesting, usually unique, uh, world views. Because those tend to be the characters that you wants to see the most in stories. Like whenever something interesting happens, whenever there's some major event in the story, you want to see that character's response to it. You want to see their reactions. 
a good example of that would be uh, BBC's, uh, or rather Benedict Cumberbatch's Sherlock. And a very interesting way of looking at the world around him. And you always wanted to see his take on stuff. It's not necessarily the same thing as making a character likable, like as a person, but when a character is interesting, they are the characters that you want to see the most, that you want to see more of. And that is a big part of a character being likable. I remember watching the American live-action version of Ghost in the Shell. And the opening for that movie being such a stark contrast and example of the difference, like one of the big differences that I've noticed between Japanese storytelling and American storytelling. Because the Japanese approach to making an interesting character, or at least a likable character, is just to make the character interesting, to give them an interesting origin story and interesting abilities and an interesting personality with the expectation that if the character is written well enough the audience will care and the audience will want to see what happens with this character because they are interesting. Whereas the more western standard approach to making a likable character is just to make them sympathetic. To be like, oh look at all this horrible stuff that happened to this character. And to look at how nasty their life is. What was me? They didn't ask to be a cyborg, this was just this just happened to them. Look at how sad that is. And, yeah, I guess that seems to work with a lot of audiences, but not so much with me, just because I've seen it so much, like, when every character is just a sympathy fest, that to me gets boring. Another standard approach to making protagonists likable is to make them relatable. And that's not bad. It's actually pretty good, but I would argue that interesting is more important. Because, again, everybody is taking the approach of making the characters relatable. But if you're looking for a new experience to give to your audience, then interesting characters is more important. If you can do relatable and interesting, then that's obviously better. Have a, a layered character where one layer is relatable and the other is something that's different and unique. Something that audiences haven't seen before. Yeah, at least when I'm writing the stories, I find that the characters that I have the most fun with and that I get excited about writing the most are the ones who have um, interesting and unique worldviews. I look forward to addressing different scenes from that character's perspective. And one thing that I feel I do a fairly decent job of in my writing is 
getting into the head of different worldviews. When my editor was going through the Chronomancer manuscript, there's this uh, particular area that she complimented more than any of the other areas. And it was actually uh, one of the spots where I felt the story was weakest. So it was actually um, quite encouraging to hear her uh, have so many compliments for it because uh, here I was thinking I didn't do a great job of that, but that's probably an example of people having different tastes or different appreciations because the area that she was talking about, the uh, one where you see uh, more of elven culture, uh, particularly high elves. She seemed impressed with how well I captured that um, atmosphere. And I had spent quite a lot of time working on getting into the mentality of high elves. Like, I didn't know ahead of time how well I was going to do. I, I did prepare myself for it as best as I could, and I think I did do um, a bit of improvements in the revisions that I did before sending it off for editing. Because I know that some of that was just getting the right diction. Um, getting a solid understanding of how these characters would speak. Something very interesting about writing Zera in, in particular is that she is very poetically minded and an encourager by nature. Like, she spends so much time finding the words of encouragement for people and looking at something that is clearly a negative and finding ways of putting a positive spin on it. To go like, yeah, that's one way of looking at the situation, but here's another. Which is very like, everything has a purpose and everything dark can be repurposed for something good. Your writing Zera was one of the great pleasures of mine, writing Chronomancer, because just the practice of getting into her head and uh, remembering to look at the world the way that she does, it made me a better person, just the process of doing that. Like that's one of the reasons I got kind of sad once the story was over. Was it like I wouldn't be doing that so much for the, for a while? And Zira's worldview was definitely not the only one that I had to uh, remember to uh, keep in mind whenever writing these scenes, because there's also. Baruda was very like old fashioned uh, barbarian warrior uh, and Nash. Who has like a very dark default disposition, which is in contrast with the way that he's been learning to look at the world over the course of the time that he's been with Barut and Arid. One of the tricky things about writing a group as diverse as the group in Chronomancer was um, acknowledging that different readers will 
relates to different worldviews. And the characters are each presenting so many different ways of looking at the world. And it was important to not pit you one of them as being with ghouls to set out like the other. correct one. I wanted to present different perspectives and have them each be recognized as valuable, regardless of whether or not they were correct. And part of that was finding ways of writing the dialogue in such a way as each character was able to present their perspectives without being put down by the other characters. That was a much higher jump than I thought I could do. And now I can't get back down. That was unfortunate. Isn't that just like a giant cat? Climb up to the top of a tall building and then be like, Nah, I can't get back down, somebody save me. Hey, made it to the end of the video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to leave a like. Leave a comment to let me know what you think. And subscribe to stay notified about future content. Until next time, thanks again for watching. I hope you're all staying safe. I'll see you later.